Okay, so the topic of this video today is, you know, how to build a cladogram. So well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Well, first of all, a cladogram is a branching diagram that is used to show how related organisms may be to one another and characteristics that they might share in common. Well, to begin, let me look at this table right here. I'm going to put an X underneath the name of every organism that has a backbone. You can see the human fossil, the mouse, the lizard, the salamander, and fish. Well, these are all vertebrates. They all have backbones. Well, now, of these five species, which of these have lungs? Well, everything, excuse me, everything but the fish. If I look at these five fossils, well, which one of these five have claws or nails? Well, that would be the lizard, the mouse, and the human. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. Which of these five species, which ones have fur? Well, that would be the mouse and the human. Mouse and mice and humans are mammals. And then which of these have an opposable thumb? Well, that would be the human. Okay, now you're going to start to see why this was important in a moment. To get started with my cladogram, I'm really just going to draw a straight line you know, from bottom and angling upward. And I'm going to use this straight line as my main branch in my cladogram. And one thing I like to look for is what is something that they all have in common? You know, all five of these have a backbone. But then I need to look for what is, uh, you know, play, you know, you've all probably played the game, one of these things is not like the other. Well, of the five animals, which is not like the other four, I can see from my checks or my X's in my table that the fish are not like the others because the fish don't have lungs. Everything above, everything besides the fish has lungs. So I'm going to make a, uh, my first branch is going to separate the fish. And everything above that branch is going to be labeled with lungs. Well, that's because fish don't have lungs. You know, they breathe with the assistance of gills. Well, now what? Now when I look at my, uh, my X's in my table, now that the fish has been separated, is there any of the four animals left, the salamander, the lizard, the mouse, and the human, how is one of these different from the other? And you can see that of the four left, salamanders don't have claws or nails. So I'm going to branch off next with my salamander. And the reason I chose the salamander is because the lizard, the mouse, and the human have claws or nails. Salamanders are on a separate branch. You might know that they lack claws, or they don't have claws or nails. Okay, so now I have the lizard, the mouse, and the human. Between the lizard, the mouse, and the human, how is one different from the other two? In my X, uh, the table with my X's, I can see that the lizard doesn't have fur, but the mouse and the human do. So that tells me that the lizard is going to be my next branch. And above that are going to be animals with fur. Well, you should know that lizards don't have fur. Okay, so now let's come down to the mouse and the human. How can I distinguish between the mouse and the human? Well, I can see that mice do not have opposable thumbs, but humans do. So that would branch off the mice. And uh, on the right side, this branch opposable thumbs would lead to humans. And the branch of the mice, uh, of the mouse, well, you know, you might know that they have no opposable thumbs. So in this cladogram that I've now drawn, I can kind of start to analyze and, and see relationships and similarities. You know, one thing I also want to point out, cladograms can be kind of viewed as a timeline. Starting at the bottom is longer ago, and near the top is kind of present day. So I can see, and this matches to the rock layers on the right-hand side of the screen. I can see that the fish are at the bottom of the rock layers. Well, that's why they were the first one to branch away as well. See how the data matches. Because the fish are the oldest of the organisms, they were the first ones to branch away. According to the rock layers, I can see that the salamanders are a little uh, uh, younger of a species than the fish, and that's why they branched off next. When I continue up the rock layers, I come to the lizards. Notice how the lizards are, uh, are in the middle of the five, and notice how in my cladogram, they're in the middle of the five to branch away. And then finally, I, uh, getting nearer the top, we have the, the mouse. 
which branched off. And then at the very top, uh, the most recent of creatures, the most recent of these creatures at the top being the human. So when I look at the cladogram that I drew and I compare it to the fossil evidence, hopefully they match and I don't have any discrepancies. Okay, so now I can kind of do a little bit of analysis. According to my cladogram, which of these organisms have lungs? You can see the characteristic of lungs is flashing just to kind of draw your attention to it. Well, how do I read this? Well, from that label, from the label of lungs, from that point up, everything from that point up possesses lungs. That would be the salamander, the lizard, the mouse, and the human. Everything below that point which is only the fish in this example, does not have lungs. So the correct answer would be the human, the mouse, the lizard, and the salamander. If I were to give you this question, what does a lizard and a human have in common according to this cladogram? Let me just highlight in red the branch of uh, leading to lizards and the branch leading to humans. Well, everything before they branch, they have in common. That would be the backbone, that would be lungs, that would be claws or nails, and that's it. Notice how the lizards now split to the left and the humans split to the right, but everything before the split, everything before they separate, they possess in common. Why could this cladogram, or any cladogram, why would it be considered a tentative hypothesis? You know, this is a harder one, you know, pause the video and think about it. Well, the reason why a cladogram would be considered a tentative hypothesis is because we're always learning more information. You know, we're building cladograms with the amount of information that we have currently. New discoveries, new uh, observations uh, could shed more light and could change our view of, of their evolutionary history. And so keep in mind, if we're, if we're using fossils to build a cladogram, you know, the fossil record is very incomplete. There's gaps in the fossil records. You don't often get full fossil, fossilized uh, skeletons. You get fragments of organisms. And so, uh, you know, we might be misinterpreting the fossil evidence. So keep in mind, anytime you see a cladogram, it's our best hypothesis, it's the best guess at the time that it was created. New information could cause it to be recreated. Let's do another example of a cladogram. Let's kind of do a silly example first. Modes of transportation here, a bicycle, a car, a motorcycle, an airplane, uh, walking on foot, and a unicycle. Well, let me, uh, like before, let me use the X's. Which of these modes of transportation has a motor? Well, that would be the car, the motorcycle, and the airplane. Which of these has at least one single wheel? Well, that would be everything besides walking on foot. Which of these modes of transportation has wings? Well, that would be the airplane. Which of these modes of transportation is the rider enclosed? Well, that would be the car and the airplane. Which mode of trans modes of transportation requires energy? Well, that would be all of them. Even walking on foot requires energy from your own body. And which of these modes of transportation has multiple wheels? Well, that would be the bicycle, the car, the motorcycle, and the airplane. Okay, so how can we get started? I'm going to draw my, my straight line like I did in the previous example, and I'm going to look for one thing that they all have in common. Right here, they all require the use of energy. So that's going to be my beginning characteristic. Well, now, again, like we did before, let's play the game one of these things is not like the other. Which one is not like the other? Well, that's pretty straightforward, I hope. Walking on foot, that's going to be my first branch. It's not like the other modes of transportation because all the other modes of transportation have wheels. And of course, walking on foot does not. So now that on foot has been eliminated, of the five that are left, the bicycle, the car, the motorcycle, the airplane, and the unicycle, which of those five is not like the other four? There it is, multiple wheels. So I know that a unicycle would be my next branch because everything remaining has multiple wheels, but a unicycle has only a single wheel. So of the four modes of transportation left, the bicycle, the car, the motorcycle, and the airplane, of the four that are left, how is one different from the other three? Well, there it is. 
I can see that the bicycle is going to be my next branch because it's not like the three that are left. It's not like the car, the motorcycle, and the airplane. They have a motor. A bicycle, of course, is on a branch that does not have a motor. Well, between the car, motorcycle, and airplane, how, uh, what would come next? The car, motorcycle, and airplane, how is one different from the other two that are left? Well, that would be the rider is enclosed. I know that a motorcycle has to be my next branch because a car and an airplane have the rider enclosed. And of course, a motorcycle is, uh, uh, the rider is not enclosed. It's open to the wind. And then between the car and the airplane, between the car and the airplane, you know, how is one different from the other? Well, there's my characteristic of wings. I know that the motorcycle, uh, excuse me, between the car and the airplane, I know that the car is going to be next because the, the wings uh, leads to the airplane and the car is on a branch labeled no wings. Well, let's analyze this really quick. If I were to ask you to list the traits of a car, well, let me highlight the path that the car is on. And when I do, all you have to do is just read what's on that red line. I can see energy uh, has a wheel. In fact, has multiple wheels, has a motor, and the rider is enclosed. You could probably even say it has no wings, but is not having a characteristic, really a characteristic. So that's why I only, uh, in my answers here, I labeled the five that the car actually does possess. Which modes of transportation would possess a motor? You can see the motor is flashing to draw your attention to it. Well, like we saw in the fossil example a moment ago, from this point up, from that characteristic up, everything has a motor. So that you can see, I hope there are three answers. The motorcycle, the car, and the airplane, they all possess a motor. And everything below that, the bicycle, the unicycle, and the foot, does not. Okay, so here's the last example in this presentation of building a cladogram. Let's look at these rock layers here. Pretend that these are the fossilized remains of some animal species that lived a long time ago. So don't view them as screws and nails. Pretend they are the fossilized remains. Species A, B, C, D, E, and F. We're going to build a cladogram out of these six species right here. So I'm going to draw my straight line. Now remember, a cladogram is a timeline. The bottom of the, of the timeline represents longer ago. Species B is buried the deepest. Well, that tells me it's the oldest. Now, before we start branching them off, what's one thing that they all have in common? Well, I can see that they all have a pointy end on them. Now that I've identified one characteristic that they all possess, I'm going to start branching and separating these. So now I can start to play the game of one of these things is not like the other. I know fossil B is going to be my first branch because it's the oldest. So how is fossil B different than all the others above it? Well, I hope you see a pretty obvious distinction. Everything above fossil B has a straight body, but fossil B has a curved body. Okay, so now I'm going to work my way up the rock layers, and I come to species F. I know that species F is going to be my next branch because it's the next fossil species that I encounter. So how is fossil F different from all the other ones above it? Probably the most obvious thing that I notice is that everything above fossil F has a head. Fossil F does not. So as I work my way up, I now come to species A. So I know species A is going to be my next branch. Well, if I play how is A different than C, E, and D, I hope uh, probably the most obvious thing that sticks out to me is that everything above fossil A has spiral threads going around its body. However, species A does not have those spiral threads. As I continue to work my way up, I come to species D. And so species D is going to be my next branch. Well, how are the species above species D, how are they different? Well, the most, I think the most recognizable thing that I can see is that C and E have some kind of pattern on their head, but species D does not have a pattern on its head. And as I come up to uh, species C next, well, what is different between species C and species E? I notice that species E has a plus shaped pattern on its head, while species C has a minus shaped a minus shaped pattern on its head. And so now I can do a quick analysis. 
you know, when I analyze this, uh, this, you know, very fictional cladogram here, what do species A and species C have in common? Well, let me highlight in red uh, their individual paths. And so we can see where they split. They split right there where that blue arrow is indicating. That means everything before the split they have in common. That would be a point, a straight body, and a head. That's, those are three things that I know that species A and C have in common by reading this cladogram. Which species has spiral threats? Well, we've done this now in a couple examples. From this point up, everything has spiral threads. That would be species D, C, and E. Everything below that point, B, F, and A, do not have spiral threads. And as I said earlier, why would this cladogram be viewed as a hypothesis, a tentative hypothesis? Now, granted, this is just a silly example. These aren't real animals and, and fossils here. But if this were a, a real cladogram involving real animals or plants or organisms, again, uh, cladograms are very much viewed as ten, a tentative hypothesis because of missing information. There's gaps within the fossil record. There could be some data that we're misinterpreting. So a cladogram it would be considered fluid. It could be adjusted and amended as more information is discovered. And so there you have hopefully three examples of building cladograms. And I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching.